Hi, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm asking everyone uh, if you could please share this with your uh, various uh, platforms that you use, be it Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, other social media platforms, to reach a lot more people, uh, have a stronger impact. Uh, there's a lot, uh, a lot going on right now in the Jewish world. There's an upsurge of anti-Semitism all over the place. There's an Islamic conference that's uh, going to be taking place uh, next weekend here in Toronto, a major conference, and lots of the speakers, a lot of speakers there. Uh, call for action of Israel, uh, open anti-Semitism, targeting of synagogues. There's, uh, it's been in the Jewish media anyways, uh, an issue with, it's called the Mapping Project, targeting uh, synagogues right now and Jewish organizations and Jewish in individuals in the Boston area right now. And that's going to be expanded because BDS groups throughout North America are promoting it. Um, the Parsha this week, it's, <clears throat> it's very uh, uh, important. Every Parsha is important, but the lessons from this one, Parsha's Korach. And Parsha's Korach, there was an individual, extremely wealthy Jewish man, 
had a lot of power, Korach. And he organized a rebellion against Moses, the Jewish leader. Moses, who, who spoke to God, received the Torah from the Jewish, for the Jewish people. He came down to give it to the Jewish people, transmit it to explain it to the Jewish people. And Korach said, who are you? He belittled the uh, stature of Moses and what he stood for. And it wasn't enough that he was extremely wealthy, Korach, but um, that wasn't enough for him. He wanted that honor, that respect that Moses had. We see what's going on in Israel right now. And I don't really like getting into the politics in Israel because although I am, I just came back from Israel, I had to rush here to Toronto to attend the funeral and then I'm gonna be attending a wedding and then I'm going back to Israel to uh, establish uh, my home in Israel. It's taken all these years, but, um, and that's where Jews should be. But, you know, my life has built it to uh, uh, defending Jews against anti-Semitism uh, through protests, through a lot of different means, uh, be it when we went after Nazi war criminals years ago and, uh, and neo-Nazis and Ernst Zundel and various teachers that were promoting Hitler in the classroom. And now we have the BDS and we've taken stands against that in Israel. Uh, in the, the previous elections and the coalition government led by Naftali Bennett, uh, there seems to be almost like this left-wing ideology, uh, and I don't even know if you could really call it that, an acceptance of BDS, that if you question it, if you say something against it, you're called a racist. That kind of language has been used in Israel for the past year. And I have seen, since I was in Israel, the past two and a half months, three months, that because of this particular type of coalition, and those, those are the words I'm using, um, Arabs in Israel felt free to go out there to various universities and hold PLO flags. They felt emboldened by this particular coalition. There were terrorist attacks in Israel, serious terror attacks. And there were celebrations in Gaza and in other places in Judea and Samaria and Arab communities, celebrations taking place. We had the issue of a, an Arab reporter from Al Jazeera in Jenin, who was covering a story where the Israeli army were going in pursuit of terrorists that had what to do with these terrorist attacks. And there was fire going back and forth from the IDF soldiers and terrorists. And a journalist gets killed. In the past 30 years, there's been over 2,600 journalists killed in similar circumstances in the war zones and conflict zones. But only Israel is targeted, and they and the line is that Israel planned it, premeditated it, had no right to be in Jenin. This is pure anti-Semitism. We're going to be discussing Israel and anti-Semitism tonight, the BDS. We have, have an expert with us, years of experience. Brigadier General Amir Avivi, it's show. I want to welcome him to the show himself on the line for the Jewish people for Israel. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. How are you? Thank you. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you. Very Thank you. Uh, Amir, you, you put together a study recently. I mean, it's not the only study you put together, but there was a recently there was a research uh, paper that you presented, and it had to do with uh, Arabs in Israel that I think you said in organization that approximately 75% of Arab Israelis do not accept the right of the Jewish people to a state in the land of Israel. And 20, about 25% of the Arab population in Israel said that they would, if there was a war against Israel, they would join it. I assume that's a younger uh, aspect of the Arab in Israel that says that, because the older ones won't necessarily. That's, 
just assuming. Can you explain the study, explain, you know, challenges going on in Israel right now? Well, actually, it was more than a study. It was a survey, a national survey we okay. did. And we asked questions that simply were not asked uh, before. The Arab society, we, we, we asked straightforward questions. And um, what we learned from this uh, survey is that about a quarter of the Israeli Arab society uh, that has, uh, you know, that has been part of Israeli economy, doctors and professors and so on, uh, a quarter of the Israeli Arab society feel part of the society. 50% of the Israeli Arab society they are sitting on the bench looking who will prevail and that's conveying a simple message. As long as you are strong, resolute, united, we'll be, you know, we'll live our lives as uh, civilians. But in a case where, you know, the shift of power uh, will come to be, we might ch change our position. And then there is this 25% which are Islamistic, which are nationalistic, which side with Hamas and the terrorist ideologies. And uh, they are saying clearly, I mean, we, we, we will fight. Maybe we are not doing that uh, actively at the moment because at the end of the day, people are afraid to go to jail, to get arrested or maybe killed. Uh, but definitely this part of society is uh, not in favor at all of Israel. Now, most, the vast majority say, we don't want a Jewish state. We, we want a, you know, a state like, a, I don't know, the United States, where it's simply a democracy and citizens, but no uh, Jewish identity. And I must tell you, it doesn't come as a surprise, you know, that the Arabs would rather not have a Jewish state. Where does the Rom Party fit into this? I've read statements from leaders of the Rom Party. Uh, they pulled out temporarily uh, from the uh, when there was uh, a lot of action, a lot of activity on the Temple Mount. There were Hamas rallies there, and then there were some Jews that were going there as there always have been throughout the years. You know, the, there's no, re I mean, they're pretty quiet, the Jews that go up there and they're not creating disturbances, not engaged in any violence or anything. But I saw these Hamas rallies there and I saw that uh, uh, the Ram party stepped away and they wanted to make conditions on that coal, on the Bennett coalition for coming back that they wanted Israel to forbid uh, Jews going up to the Temple Mount. How does the Ram Party fit into the survey? Well, uh, we had the whole survey about the Ram Party. Uh, we, we prepared this survey even before this uh, government was uh, formed. And right. uh, our message was really clear. Ram Party is Muslim Brotherhood ideology. They are affiliated to Hamas. They are connected to Hamas. They have Hamas ideology. They are no different than the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Hamas, or a, you know, Muslim Brotherhood in Afghanistan or in other places. They completely reject the existence of a Jewish state. Uh, they are a radical religious uh, organization. And one of the ways the Muslim Brotherhood operates is trying to infiltrate into the government. So on one hand, they educate to hate Jews, they educate against the Jewish state and so on. On the other hand, they speak softly and say, you know, we want to be part of the government. And then when they get the funds, they say to the Arabs in Arabic, we are getting hold of the land. We are taking the land from the Jews and, the, and so on. And um, we rejected completely my organization you know that is composed of more than 4000 israeli high ranking officers and commanders and so on we we said clearly that having a minority jewish government that is dependent on its existence on the muslim brotherhood this goes against any values of of zionism this is not zionism zionism is about having a clear majority 
um, Zionist government that can conduct Zionist policy. You cannot have a Zionist policy when you are dependent on your existence on a Muslim Brotherhood party or any Arab party for that matter. So I'm not saying that we are against uh, any notion of, uh, of Arabs being in the government. But first and foremost, you need to have a majority, clear majority of Zionist Jewish uh, party. And then you can check whether the Arab relevant Arab party is a partner or not, does recognize our right to exist or not, and then, and then uh, decide. There's an ax, uh, an Arab Israeli, um, activists. Uh, he served in the Golani brigades, uh, Yosef Haddad. He goes around, he advocates for Israel, he confronts the BDS. Uh, in fact, he attended a, uh, uh, a meeting in the Knesset where members of the, not the Ram, I don't believe the Ram party, but uh, Ahmed Tibi's uh, party uh, were calling him a traitor. I mean, I wish the Arabs that uh, would, would, uh, I guess, a minority in Israel are could be people like uh, Yosef Haddad that uh, accept Israel as a Jewish state and will fight for Israel and will advocate for Israel. But Israel. Well, you know, first of all, we have the Druze minority which uh, right. you know are part of the, the Jewish Israeli society. They serve in the army. Uh, I can tell you that many of the members in my organization are Druze. I have four Druze generals in, in, in my organization and many other officers. Uh, so the Druze society is definitely supporting the Jewish state. Among the Arab society, uh, I would say that the Arab Christian society is getting closer and closer to the Jewish society because they are persecuted by the Muslim uh, society. Uh, and uh, in the Israeli Arab Muslim society, as I told you, I think there is maybe 20% of the people uh, that are willing to be part of a Jewish state are not so necessarily very supportive, but you know they accept it. They accept right. the fact that this is a, a Jewish state, and the vast majority would like something else. Uh, uh, would like either a Muslim state or not a Jewish state. But, uh, and I've seen also Arabs coming to work in Israel with shirts that have an M16 on it. And that seems to be a new Let me cut trend. Point. So come here, do me a favor. Tell, every, tell yes. our audience a little more about your organization, because I, I don't think that they're quite familiar with how active and, and who it consists of. In spite of, so okay. just take a minute and just tell us about the IDSF. Okay. So two, two years ago, after I retired from the army, I decided to start a new organization of Israeli high-ranking officers, commanders, ex-warriors, all of them, of course, in reserve or uh, retired. And the mission we took upon ourselves is to ensure Israel's existence and prosperity for generations to come. So basically, we are asking a very important and simple question. What will ensure Israel's existence for the long term? And, you know, uh, we are talking about never again. We have been expelled twice for, for, from our land. We have been perse persecuted for thousands of years. Finally, we have a state. And the big question is, how do we make sure that it continues to exist? And this is not, cannot be taken for granted. It's not granted that Israel will be around if we don't do the right things. And I have seen in my, my many years of service, decision making that truly endangers the existence of Israel. So we understood that there needs to be a very dominant, strong organization uh, in the public sphere, but also uh, 
talking to decision makers that will make sure that this Zionist project stays stays uh, on on the right track and doesn't derail. And um, we ask ourselves, okay, so we understand what we want to do, but how do we do it? And, and the way we are doing it is doing three main things, both in Israel and, and also within the diaspora. One, and maybe the most important one, is educating the young generation. There is a huge, huge gap of understanding, of connection to our Jewish and Zionistic values among the young generation. We see it in Israel, in the education system. We also see it, of course, in the communities around the world. People have forgot how special we are, what the people of Israel are all about, and how important is our nation and our land and so on. And, and they're simply not educated in the right way. So we are deploying thousands. We have thousands of officers that we are deploying into the education system, in the pre-army programs, and soon also in the communities uh, around the world to really reinvigorate Zionism, to, to bring back the pride Jews should have uh, about their identity and about their nation and state. And of course, also give the tools to understand our national security needs. Uh, for the long term. Um, so one thing is education. The other thing, we, we, we know that we live in a world uh, that is shaped by media and social media. So we are very, very active on media and social media. Uh, we started, of course, first of all in Israel. Today in Israel, we are very dominant uh, on these platforms. We interview every day on national TV and uh, we are active on uh, social media. Now, lately, we also uh, opened the public relations uh, department, in, an international one, so we can bring our voice also to Canada, the States, and other places. And the last thing is working with decision makers. We have a growing research department, very dominant. We are working with the decision makers in Israel, in the States, in Europe. Uh, our voice is an authoritative voice and people want to hear it and want to know what we think about different issues. And we deal with all major issues of uh, national security that have to do with the, the prosperity and existence of uh, the state of Israel and the Jewish people. So Israel has, for years already, a policy of, um, what's it called? Uh, manage the conflict. That's what they call it. I mean, I'm sure it evolves every year by year as there's different challenges. But uh, I mean, I was just I gotta I gotta throw this question at you. Um, there may be five million Jews living in diaspora, living in the United States and Canada, something like that, around that, uh, give or take. Could be a little higher, could be a little lower. Uh, how would the, uh, the policy of managing the conflict change or be affected if, let's say, one and a half million Jews moved to Israel right away, two million Jews moved to Israel right away? How would that change the dynamic in Israel, the threats and that Israel faces? Well, first of all, Mary, you're touching the most important thing Israel needs. Israel needs only one thing, Jews. That's it. You know, many times when uh, I meet uh, communities and Jews around the world, and, and many people want to help and assist the state of Israel, and they ask me, how can I help? And I say, listen, Israel doesn't need anything. It, just, it needs one thing, Jews. You want to help? Make Aliyah. Come to Israel. Um, and uh, th this is the real fight we have, you know, to have a, a, a clear, vast majority in the land uh, of Israel, a growing uh, majority. Uh, it's very important uh, and will strengthen dramatically everything, you know. It strengthens the economy, it strengthens the army, it strengthens, uh, of course, the amount of votes Jews have, uh, the, the government. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it affects everything. And Zionism has understood it from the very first day. Zionism is all about Jews 
coming to live and build their, their nation in the, state, in the land of Israel. That, that's Zionism, basically. And so this is very important. Now, you mentioned, Mayor, something very important, and it's true. Uh, the policy in the last decade or two was trying to keep things as calm as possible, yeah. uh, not shake the boat too much, yeah. uh, in order to have tourism, in order to grow the economy, and, you know, buy time. But with this policy, what we have seen in the last two decades is a constant growth uh, of two major threats. One is the Iranian threat, and the Iranian threat is not just Iran and its uh, growing uh, capabilities, talking about uh, them trying to achieve uh, nuclear we have nuclear weapons. It's also about the huge buildup of force they are doing around Israel with Hezbollah, with more than 100,000 rockets and uh, mortars and missiles and drones, it, Yemen with the Houthis, Iraq, Hamas in Gaza. Iran is building a huge force around Israel and it's building it for war. It's, it's, that is, it's not building it for fun. Okay, right. they're building a force in order to attack Israel at a certain stage where they feel they are ready enough, and uh, what will make them feel ready is three main capabilities. One is the nuclear capability. The other one is the amount of missiles they have, because missiles are very accurate, are very hard to, to shoot down, and they want enough missiles so they can shoot Israeli Air Force bases and headquarters and so on, and also, when they feel they have enough drones. In, in Lebanon, for example, until a decade ago, you had something like 50 drones. Now Hezbollah has more than 2,000. So this capability is growing seriously, and we have seen how difficult it was for the US Army to deal with the drone attacks in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's not a simple issue to deal with. And we've seen the drone attacks also on Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and the, the, the level of uh, destruction that this uh, capability can, uh, can achieve. Um, so one thing is, is this Iranian uh, buildup of uh, force. It has go been going on for a long time, but now it achieved a certain level of readiness that makes it much more dangerous. You cannot just continue and buy time with the Iranians. You need to be proactive. The other thing is that we have been buying time talking about the Palestinian threat. Now, the Palestinian threat today, it's not only Hamas, it's not only the Palestinian Authority that uh, seeks the destruction of Israel, just like Hamas. It's also this part of the Israeli Arab society that is working with Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. And basically, we see a Palestinian campaign all over the land of Israel and trying to achieve uh, three main things. One is acting like Zionism has acted for many years, grabbing land, taking the land. So they are taking our land in, in Judea and Samaria. They are taking the land in the Negev. They are doing that in the Galil and in the mixed cities. And this is maybe the biggest threat Israel is facing. Illegal takeover of the land. Now, it's not that we are not dealing with it well enough. We are not dealing with it at all. I mean, they're taking all of our land, all of our, all of our country, and we're not doing anything. We're not countering that. The other thing is destabilizing completely the, the sense of security of Jews anywhere in Israel. So you see it on the roads of Judea and Samaria, but you also see it in the Negev, with the Bedouins terrorizing the, the Jews in Beersheba, in Dimona, in, in other places. You see it in the Galil, uh, you see it very clearly in the mixed cities, like Lod, like Acre, mm -hmm. you see it in Jerusalem, it's all around. 
And the last thing, and this is classic, uh, you know, uh, classic uh, BDS stuff is completely destroying And we are talking about this full-scale campaign of the Palestinians. We cannot continue to just buy time. We need to be proactive. Coming I mean, years, a Yom Kippur scenario where we are completely surprised and attacked on multiple uh, areas. You know, Iran and Palestinians and mixed cities and all of that. We saw it last year on a small scale. It can get much bigger. Or we want a six-day war where we are proactive. We are the ones who shape our own future. Now, we prepared a very, very uh, in-depth uh, assessment of every aspect of what I talked now. And what uh, we prepared is, being, is going to be presented in the coming months to all the leaders of Israel. Uh, to all the major parties, to the president, to the chief of staff, to, to the chief of police, and so on. We are going, all our many generals and uh, researchers, we, we are meeting with everybody and, and talking ab exactly about what I'm saying now. Right. Understanding what is happening, understanding the threats and how they are going to affect us in the long term, and taking responsibility for our future, for our security and prosperity, and uh, being proactive. Now, there are many ways of being proactive, and you can decide first to deal with the Negev, or maybe first to deal with Hamas, or maybe first to deal with Iran. There are many ways in which you can start being proactive, but we need to do something. We cannot just sit and wait until something happens. I remember when uh, Ariel Sharon was the uh, prime minister, and before he became prime minister, there was a major upsurge in terrorist attacks going on. And then he sent the troops into uh, throughout Judea and Samaria. It seemed like he broke the back of, uh, of Hamas. And uh, he took actions against uh, leaders of Hamas in Gaza doesn't seem like we have that kind of resolve from, uh, well, certainly this government doesn't have that kind of resolve to do anything like that. What, um, what kind of probe steps would you like to see a future government take, or the army take anyways? They budgeted the, the first uh, brigade um, for the Border Patrol. And then happened something really interesting. They, they wanted to recruit very fast uh, people for this uh, new brigade. And the chief of the Border Patrol, General Amir Cohen, came to me and said, listen, Amir, we want to do this fast. We think that you guys in IDSF, in a team, which is called in Hebrew, uh, can do it faster than us. Can you campaign for us and recruit for us the, the people? And this is what we did. In two weeks, we recruited 1,400 uh, volunteers who are also going to be reserved in Border Patrol. And in this way, we helped uh, building, the starting of building of this new National Brigade. And because it was so successful, uh, we are going immediately to start uh, recruiting the next, the next two brigades. But this is still small. We need something like 100,000 100, uh, uh, people uh, defending Israel in the case of an Arab uprising, as we saw last year. So this is a process, and we want to see it accelerating. We expect the next government to accelerate this buildup of force. One thing. The other thing is, is understanding that the grabbing of land is the biggest threat Israel is facing and acting, stopping this and reversing the, the situation. Now, we know that if you go and take Bedouins now after uh, um, from the land they illegally possessed, this might create friction. This might create fight. And we're saying, okay, 
for the land will fight. And, and, and I think the more resolute the government will be, the less fight there will be. I mean, if they see that we, we, we are meaning and we are doing what we mean, and if, we, if needed, we are even willing to bring the army for that, mm -hmm. then I, 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 I know that this mentality, they, they understand that we are serious and we will be able to achieve our goals. Uh, the other thing is, you know, there is a discussion now about Iran. We completely reject any going back to the JCPOA. The JCPOA is a disaster. Right. right. And I want to explain why. The first reason is that going back to the JCPOA means relieving sanctions. If sanctions will be relieved, the Iranians will be able immediately to invest tens of billions of dollars in the buildup of the forces around Israel. This will end up with a, with a big war. Think about it. Israel is getting uh, aid from the states, $3 billion a year. The Iranians will be able to invest in a short time tens of billions of dollars. We won't be able to catch up with this buildup of force. And it will bring them very fast to an ability to attack. The second reason is that this agreement basically says that when it's finished, it has a sunset, the Iranians will be able to, to have uh, as many enriched uranium as they want, meaning they will be able to have a hundred atomic bombs. Now, this will create a, 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 a situation where all the states in the Middle East will move towards having nuclear capabilities. The proliferation will be all over the place. This is not going to endanger just Israel. This would be a global threat. Today you have nuclear capabilities. Very few countries have it. If this goes into proliferation in, in this very unstable region of the Middle East, the world is not going to be a, a safe world. So this cannot happen. And the, the third thing is that if there is an international agreement with Iran, how can Israel attack against an international agreement? We won't have the legitimacy needed to do what we need to do. We need to destroy Iranians' capability. And, and the best scenario is not doing it by ourselves. We expect the United States of America to ally with us. It's not our problem. It's a global problem. Iran is a global threat. And we expect the administration to understand that. American Jews regarding uh, uh, the Iranian deal that we're talking about. So they, uh, I something about... Before I talk mm -hmm. about American Jews, I, I want to say something about the Congress and yep. Senate. Yep. We've met with many senators and congressmen, both Republican and Democratic. I feel that everybody is worried about Iran. Okay. And you know, even, even uh, many Democratic uh, congressmen and senators, in closed doors, when we talk, they say, guys, you know, you are right, and, and Iran is a big problem. And you Israelis do what you need to do. If you need to attack Iran, do it. Don't count on us. It's not happening at the moment. And uh, it's sad to hear that, but you know, that is the reality. But I think that many, many uh, congressmen and senators share um, the understanding that, that Iran is, is a huge threat and something needs to be done. Um, okay, talking so about the Jews, I think that many are worried about mm -hmm. what's going on inside Israel. You know, these terror attacks, um, this political instability we are having in the last uh, two years. And, you know, our message to, to our politicians, you know, we are not a political entity. We don't support any, any uh, party right. or... Right. But our message is, 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 a, is a national security message and a Zionist message. And, and we are saying right. to, to the politicians, you have to understand that we are facing one of the most 
a problematic times, very dangerous time for Israel. And in such times, people you need to unite. All these inner fights, you know, yes, BB, no, BB, Lapi, whatever. It's irrelevant to, the, to reality. These guys are forgetting that there is a state, there is a nation, there are people to defend. And, and we cannot afford uh, these fights. And, and I'm telling also to all the Jewish communities, listen, we Jews love to argue so much, you know, about Judea and Samaria, two states, not two yep. states, and so on. It's completely irrelevant. The other side is talking about full destructions of the people of Israel. Nobody on the other side is talking about two states. Nobody in the BDS or in this international arena is talking about two states.
Israel. But the the GDP in Israel right now, uh, they say by the end of this year, uh, Israel could be knocking on the door of about approximately half a trillion dollars of GDP. So right now it's about 450 billion, something like that. So uh, the uh, the aid, if you even want to call it aid, or uh, mutual agreement, but it works out to about 3.5 billion, is not even 1%. At one time, the aid from the United States a number of years ago was over 10%. I'm wondering if Israelis, if Israeli Jews will eventually emerge to recognize how strong and what kind of a superpower Israel is so that the conversations they have with uh, world leaders is sort of like a second class looking up, almost like begging for your support, but that we could set the tone, the direction. Is there like a, a thinking, a change of thinking you see happening or how do you well, see it? Uh, I think that, uh, first of all, what you said is right. Uh, Israel is, is getting very strong in many fields. Uh, the war in Ukraine uh, has affected a lot the relationship between Israel and Europe in the sense that the uh, Europeans su suddenly realize that actually, you know, Instagram hasn't changed human nature. Amazing. You know, human nature has remained the same. And, um, and they understand that big wars can happen, you know, and they need to be ready. And they, they pretty much rely on Israeli know-how, technology, and, and so on. And now they need, the, you know, they want to be less reliant on Russia talking about gas. And Israel has the huge reserves of gas. So, you know, they want to uh, import uh, gas from Israel, and this is a very big deal. It strengthens Israel. But Israel needs to know how to leverage this. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, we don't do it enough. I mean, if they are dependent on us, okay, we have some demands too, you know, stop funding uh, all this uh, takeover of land, they stop uh, pestering us about uh, our towns in Judea and Samaria, or even uh, in the Negev and so on. I mean, we have a lot of things we can demand. Right. And they, we're not doing enough. We're not doing enough. We're not proud enough. We're not uh, ins insisting enough or on, on, on our interests. And, and in this world, if you don't respect yourself, nobody will respect you. you. You need to respect yourself, first of all. And the world is all about interests. They have interests. Very good. We have interests as well. And we, we need to know how to leverage them. This is something I'm expecting from, from the next government to be more resolute when it comes to Israel's national security and interests and use the strengths we have to, you know, to benefit Israel. Right. Uh, you know, just as we did with the, the Abraham Accords. I mean, the Sunni Arab world is, is petrified by Iran. They understand they need Israel. And we managed, together with the former American administration, to achieve this peace mm -hmm. deal, this economical deals, and so on, because there was a clear interest. They needed us. We wanted to expand our uh, relations in, in the Middle East, and we did that. Now, talking about the aid we're getting from the U.S., first of all, the U.S. Hey, is boy. getting a huge benefits from that okay huge mm -hmm. much bigger than the way by the way than the amount of money we're getting and then um, because it's not a significant part of our economy anymore it raises a question in the very long term really if we need to continue this kind of uh, relationship or change it you know um, build a, a very in-depth cooperation with the U.S. because we are allies, but not based on aid. Because when you, you get money as aid, you become dependent in many ways. Right. You take right. something from the sovereignty. We can get much more money and be much less dependent and build a different kind of relationship. And, and I think we, we should be looking at that. It's time for Israel to, to look again 
And I'm not saying it because I think we should diminish the relations. On the, on the contrary, we should deepen mm -hmm. the relations, right. but in a, in a different way. Uh, in a completely different way, we are doing that with other uh, other countries, and um, this can be in the long term very beneficial uh, for Israel. Do you see relations uh, blossoming between uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel? I don't know if blossoming is the right or word. coming to well, whatever the term. Would be. But we have strong common interests. And, and I and I think that uh, definitely when we look at uh, the possibility of an agreement with Iran and Iran moving forward with with uh, their nuclear plans and so on, definitely it brings Israel and Saudi Arabia closer. Uh, we have been in good relations for many years now, um, but. Um, I think there is inner politics in Saudi Arabia that uh, create the reality where it's not moving the way it did with the Gulf states and so on. So maybe they need a bit more time, but I think that eventually it will probably uh, normalize uh, the relations. You know, before just before the Abraham Accords, uh, Jared Kushner he initiated a. Um, some kind of an economic summit uh, that included Arab countries and also included, uh, like you were alluding to, uh, leaders of various Arab tribes in Judea and Samaria. And there were a number of them that came forward that wanted to uh, learn how to prosper and make deals and so on and so forth. Now the PA, Palestinian Authority, jailed many of those uh, Arab uh, tribal leaders that participated, but um, uh, I mean, I, I think that's what you were getting at, uh, looking at alternative leadership, uh, Arab alternative leadership in Judea and Samaria. Is that, am I correct with that? One of my friends from Hebron, uh, Jabri family, attended this uh, summit. And because there are very strong and also very well armed um, tribe, tribe in uh, Hebron, the Palestinian Authority didn't do anything, didn't arrest him. Uh, but definitely, definitely there is a um, leadership that is ready to step forward. Uh, and replace this corrupt and terrorist uh, entity, the Palestinian Authority. Definitely, definitely there is a um, leadership that is ready to step forward uh, and replace this corrupt and terrorist uh, entity, the Palestinian Authority. Absolutely. I think we got a short video to show before we wrap it up, but we got a video about, there was a rally today on the Temple Mount um uh, a Hamas rally
when I was there. Well, I think that the Hamas understand, understand what the Ben Gurion understood, that Jerusalem, especially the Temple Mount, is the heart and the soul of the Jewish people. If you manage to kill the heart and the soul, the body will die afterwards. And uh, it's clear, you know, I talked about it in the Knesset no, no, not long ago, that Israel right. needs to understand that Hamas shifted the fight from fighting from Gaza to a mobilizing Palestinians in Judea and Samaria and in Jeru Jerusalem uh, to uh, attack, you know, and, 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 pro and protest and so on in, in the Temple Mount. And um, our answer would be really simple. Raise our flags, as we did in the last amazing parade in Jerusalem's day. I was there. I was there. Them, yeah. yeah, me too. It was amazing. Yeah. I think it was the biggest one ever. Incredible. Yeah. I don't even know how many people were there. been over a hundred thousand jews definitely unreal this is, this is the answer you know respecting our sovereignty and uh, maintaining all law and order on temple mount i mean imagine if some people would riot in the vatican or any other place they would get arrested right, in right. so you know law and order that's it and and, and sovereignty it's, it's our nation it's our land and uh, you know we we need to enable freedom of prayer for people who actually come to pray not for uh, people who come to throw stones and uh, molotov right. and uh, shout that uh, israel should be destroyed right right 100 percent. okay uh amir uh, brigadier general amir uh, avivi listen thank you very much for being with us uh we want to have you on many more times going forward. The issues are so important. We're living in historic times right now. The elections are coming up. The issues are whether an Israeli state, in quotations, or a Jewish state, there is a difference. Uh, it's important to have a Jewish state. We waited 2,000 years, and uh, you know the debate is going on right now. Um, Final word that you could leave our viewers and those who are going to share this uh, before we sign off. What could you say? Yes, I, yes, I, I want to say that in all this fight against anti-Semitism, the most important thing in this fight is working on, on, on our own education and identity and proudness because this is the key issue. You know, the key issue is our inner strengths. More than we did, need to deal with them, we need to really be focused on ourselves and strengthen our identity, our connection, our friendship and togetherness. You know, we have to unite as people and remember that we have enough enemies around us. 
but only one Jewish nation and one Jewish state. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us, watching the show. Please share this on your different platforms that you're with. We'll reach a lot more people and make a difference. And that's what we want to do. And that's the purpose of the show, to make a difference, to fight back using social media, to get the truth out there, and to convince you and get you to think differently about uh, Israel and their responsibilities to the Jewish people and to uh, the state of Israel. It's our one state. This is historic times. Uh, after 2,000 years, who would think? that there are now over 7 million Jews living in Israel. The majority of Jews in the world live in Israel today. The majority of Jews in the world live in Israel today. That's historic. You didn't have that during the second temple period of time. This is historic. These are historic times. And the state is thriving. And it could be better. And it wants to be better. And Jews always want to be better. And that's what it's all about. And you could only be better in Israel. Um, while you're not in Israel, help Israel in any way you can. Fight against the BDS, the fight is real. The anti-Semitic levels of these organizations, they're very clear. There is no two-state solution. They don't believe in that. They make it very clear they want Israel, the entire state destroyed, all of it destroyed. What they would do after that, I've even seen some presentations by uh, some BDS leaders uh, who spoke at Al-Qaeda events. And they said, what are we going to do after we destroy Israel? Like, they don't even know what they're going to do with their lives. They're just focused on killing Jews. Uh, uh, we're not rolling over. It's not going to be a second Auschwitz. Um, thank God we have brave Jews in the IDF. Uh, and, and again, we have Jews contributing in so many different ways in, uh, in the state of Israel. And that's our future. That's our future. So if we have a song to conclude with... Uh, Speaking of Aliyah, Left it all to be with you Distant dreams have now come true Walk the streets of legends told We've come home We've come home, we've come home And we'll never stand alone After two thousand years We are home A place called home We've come home, we've come home To a land of our own After two thousand years We are Two thousand.
thousand years we are home after two thousand years we are Thank <laughs> you.